uh, in the Eternal City. So I flew in from Madrid uh, with all like one bag, <laughs> all the stuff that I've lugged across all of Spain for the last two weeks <laughs> with all my stuff. And we, sh we sent one box too with my books and everything and arrived in uh, Rome and Fumicino Airport is way outside of the city and um, sort of near the sea. And so we get in the car with a couple other of the seminarians that were also flying in that day from various places. And you drive up and you're on the uh, on this ancient Roman road. It's one of the ancient Roman roads and you're coming up the Via Aurelia. So Aurelius, one of the um, Roman emperors at some point built this road and coming up the Via Aurelia and it's these got these walls along the side and you're you're coming in where this van and the first thing you see of of rome the first thing you can finally see is actually this view now i didn't take this picture but i found it it was that this is what it was like <laughs> uh was uh this view of saint peter's dome right everybody recognizes what's in the picture here right the the dome of of the, the basilica of saint peter and i i gotta say it was like a breathtaking experience like to, to be driving up, uh, then through this whole awesome experience of World Youth, Youth Day, I got to see Pope Benedict in Spain and everything. But now I'm arriving in Rome and realizing, seeing St. Peter's for the first time and realizing this is now home, right? That this is, this is gonna be my home for the next uh, couple of years. Uh, so this is a great view of the interior of St. Peter's. And so that night, we we went we got into our rooms we got settled in uh, they they were forced you to everybody else they were trying to force to stay awake because they had just arrived to you know get over the jet lag I'd already been in Europe for two weeks so I was over jet lag but the next morning we woke up we went for an early morning like a 5:30 a.m. 6 a.m. mass here at St. Peter's and so how many, have you guys ever been in St. Peter's Basilica some of you so it is. I mean, there's no scale that you can even describe how big this is, but to give you uh, like a realization, these letters up here that are spelling out this, that's in this dome right here. So this is the main nave of the church and then the transepts of the church. So the church is in the sign of a sign of a cross and the main altar is right where the two pieces meet, right? And then you can, um, uh, that these letters are 12 feet tall. Oh my goodness. These letters right here. <laughs> and that's just that part. And then all the rest of the dome and, and, and everything else like that is just uh, incredible. And it, this is the second basilica that stood in the same place. The first basilica was built by Constantine, the Emperor Constantine. And that Constantinian basilica lasted until the 1600s, but by then it had become so dilapidated and um, it was being rebuilt in the 1600s. It took over 124 years of constant construction to, to build St. Peter's Basilica. Um, so again, a kid from Taos walking into, walking into this uh, beautiful place. But we did celebrate mass that day down uh, on the main level of the church. Instead, we we went, it's kind of, it's kind of like walking in these secret passages right behind these pillars right here that are the main pillars that hold up the dome. There are these like secret little doors. So you go around this little um, gate thing and you start climbing down stairs and you go down these stairs into the crypt. So into the crypt church. So there's a whole nother sort of whole nother church that's underneath the church that uh, so you get to an altar that's much closer to the tomb of St. Peter. Because what's the point of St. Peter's Basilica? Why was it built there? Any ideas? <laughs> that's where the tomb is at, right? I had just said that, yeah. <laughs> right? gold star. Yeah, 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 gold star. You got 10 points. Everyone gets 10 points. You get 10 points. Everyone. The whole point is that's where the tomb of St. Peter is. So he was he was crucified outside the city walls, outside of the Vatican city walls, uh, or outside, Vatican, outside Rome, the Roman city walls on the Vatican Hill. It was known as the Vatican Hill, even back in, Saint, in the ancient times. And he was crucified and then buried in a, a, a simple tomb uh, in, in that general close vicinity to where he had been crucified. And so then we went down into that, into that crypt 
And then not that day, but about two or three days later, we got a tour of even further down. It's called a Scavi tour. Scavi is just Italian for excavation, right? Scavi tour. So we went all the way down. You know how archaeology works, right? Like generally speaking, in most places, because of the sediments and everything that settles, as you go down, you go back in time, right? Like you, you, here's the level we see today, but as you go down, there's like another level and then there's another level. And as you excavate, as you start to do all the archeological work, you go, as you go deeper, you go further back in time. That just makes sense, right? You have a flood, you have things, all the sediment kind of piles back on top and you just sort of keep building taller and taller. So this, you can see, it, what does this kind of look like to you? If you're just like looking at this, where would you think you were? Outside. Outside. You're about 20 feet underground. <laughs> Under the modern day ground. But 2,000 years ago, you were outside, right? <laughs> uh, so they excavated all of this. And it's like a, a building, right? And this would have been the door into, into a room. And this would have been like some sort of alleyway or something. And this was the outside of the building. All of this is under the St. Peter's Basilica, only rediscovered in the 20th century. Only these excavations only started actually in the 1940s, um, kind of post-World War II, while they were, archaeology was coming to a head. And then also because, I don't know, there was interest in archaeology starting in the 1940s. And after World War II, they were rebuilding so much of Rome from the damage and the war and everything. They decided to go, it'd be really good to, to excavate, right? So we, on this tour, and anybody can take a Scavi tour, by the way. You guys want to take a Scavi tour? Well, we're going to take a little bit of a Scavi tour. But when you're in Rome, and when you go to Rome, <laughs> you'll be able to do one of these Scavi tours. I can, they're, they only allow 250 people down a day, and you get a tour guide and everything. But uh, you, if you ask for a request, or like if I send a letter with you, it, it's easier to get in. You know, there's, it's how the... Italians work, right? You can send a letter, send a little bit of money, then you can you can get in, right? So this gives you a sense of this is what you see above. This is where the altar is, the main altar uh, in St. Peter's. It's like we're looking at St. Peter's sideways, right? And then this here, and th these are the ways down to the crypt church. So this is where that crypt church is today, that, that pillar that I told you about, right? Uh, and then this is further down. This would have been the street level at the time of, of um, 2,000 years ago, the time of St. Peter's Martyrdom, right? And so what they found when they were doing excavations is there was no confirmation ever like that. It was, it was just the tradition that St. Peter was buried there, but there was nobody could like point to and say exactly the location. But as they were excavating, the, the, the tradition was St. Peter was buried and everything was built on top of that location. So the tomb, then they put an altar on top. Then, then later on, once Constantine built, he put another altar on top. And then when they tore down Constantine's Basilica and they built the modern, the modern day Basilica, you know, 500 years old, then <laughs> they, that's where they put the modern day altar, all on top of that same location. So as they excavated, they they got deeper and deeper and they found in that little room, this little spot, this place where there was a collection of bones kind of put together. And they've done some scientific tests on the bones to realize that they were from a uh, Jewish man that would have been of the right age, the right description, all the things that would match, you know, Peter as a, as a man that grew up in, you know, Israel and, uh, you know, um, early AD time. And, uh, and somebody had scratched graffiti <laughs> right into the spot. Probably the graffiti goes back to probably 200 years after Christ. And it just wrote Petrus, Peter, um, Est in, Italian, or in Latin is uh, here. Peter is, Peter is here. So someone scratched in case people forgot, which we did. <laughs> so it took us 2,000 years when we found that, that location of... Um, of Peter's uh, Peter's grave, so it was really moving to to sell, to to go right down there. And while we were while we were down there, our tour guide 
uh, read to us from the gospel, uh, from the gospel passage of Jesus saying to Peter, uh, you are, uh, who do people say that I am? And Peter saying, well, some people, uh, well, some of people are saying you're John the Baptist. Some people are saying you're Elijah, the prophet. And then Jesus turned to Peter and said, well, no, who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of God, the one who has come into the world for salvation, right? And so uh, we read those, those words, I'm paraphrasing from the top of my head, but we read the actual words, you know, uh, in that moment. So it was, it was pretty powerful. Any questions at this point about St. Peter's and, and the Scavi under St. Peter's Basilica? You guys want to visit it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and, and just the excitement of finding all that. And there's a whole story. Uh, you can probably read an article online. There's a whole story of how they found the, the spot. Uh, they'd given up hope of finding it. And then they did find it. And, and uh, it's a really cool process of how all that happened right around and around a Pi to Pius the Twelfth was the Pope um, in the forties and fifties during the whole process. Yeah. So the bones were studied, but were they returned? They were returned. Yep. Yeah. So the, only a small, you know, portion had to be, you know, scientifically whatever they do with bones and DNA, whatever. But uh, they they were all returned. Yeah. And so they're in that spot right there, right where they've been for presumably. 1700 years because there seems to have been there's some evidence that there was a time when during the persecutions that the bones of saint peter and the bones of saint paul were moved to another location in the catacombs and then moved back into their rightful locations around the time of constantine because of the fear of the roman emperor taking the bones or marauders or something so there's evidence in all of the um primary sources that they those remains of Peter and Paul were moved, and I, we think that's why we celebrate the feast of Saint Peter and Paul together in June, because we the best evidence we have is that feast day started being celebrated when they put the bones of Peter and Paul back in their rightful places. Peter at the Vatican Hill, Paul at um, Saint Paul's outside the walls, uh, at where he was martyred and buried, uh, Saint Paul's Basilica, which is a beautiful church too. All right, so that's St. Peter's. That was first couple of days in Rome. I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. <laughs> so now I'll give you a little look where I lived for, well, I said five years. That's wrong. I don't know how I put that. It's four years. I lived there four years. Uh, and uh, so this is the North American College. Uh, pretty big institution, as you can see. It's where all of the seminarians, so those who are starting to become Catholic priests from the um, United States, Australia and Canada. So all of the Americans, the Australians and the Canadians, that's where we lived. It's where we lived together, where we did our classes, like about becoming a priest, but all of our academic courses were in the city. So this is just, this is just where we, where we live. This is our, our chapel was right here. And these are the different parts of it, the tower. Uh, this rooftop right here was my favorite place to hang out here. And here, this tower was under construction the whole time I was living there, right outside my window for like 18 months. It was awful. But um, I never, I could have moved rooms, but I didn't. I don't know why. But because uh, as you went up the scale each year, you could request a better room because all, of course, not all the rooms were created equal. Uh, uh, so anyways, yeah, so that, the, 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 I just wanted to show you, give you a sense. Now, to give you a sense of like location, we were only about a seven minute walk from St. Peter's Square from the, the Basilica. There's this cool kind of underground garage that was built in the 2000s that would get you, uh, get you there. But only seven minute walk, so really super close. This was, uh, this would be the view from the roof. So just give you a sense of how close St. Peter's was from where we were living. This is like a, a neighborhood that's on the other side. That's St. Peter's, and we're looking away from the city. It's like you're looking, the Vatican is outside of the old city. And then when you turn around, you look, you're looking into where all of ancient Rome and, and the, the original city center is. So 
it'd be like my favorite place. Me and my buddies, we'd go up there, you know, um, have a cigar or something and just enjoy, enjoy the city, uh, enjoy the, the view. And the weather was always, I mean, the weather is pretty good in Rome. There's a few times, it snowed once when I was there and it would only snow like every 25 years. It was like, <laughs> and I loved it. When it snowed, the Italians were hilarious. They, they, they were using table salt to try to melt the snow and everything. And they were brooming it because they didn't have shovels or anything. Like, there, I remember walking through the street because I was taking, I was I wanted pictures and, and, and of all the snow and so these snow covered things. And this Italian woman came up to me. She's like, and we were dressed like this, even though we weren't priests yet, we dressed we dressed in the Roman collar as seminarians. And, and she would say, Padre, Padre, but prega per Roma. And she's like, she's like, Father, pray for Rome. This is a desire. She was like crying. She was like, just the, the scene of snow. I was like, I think we'll be okay. Prega per Roma. Yeah. Uh, so my daily, my daily life in Rome, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a tour of the city, right? How, this is how I would have walked, and me and my classmates, how we would have walked every day to class. So you might wonder like, well, why, we were at a college, why would we need to go to class, right? So the, in, the, in the European way, college is where you live, the collegio, that's a word that just means like where you gather together, right? Where you live, universita, university is where you had your studies. So it, even though I lived with Americans and Canadians and Australians in my university were people, were men, women, um, priests, uh, seminarians, religious sisters, lay people from all around the whole world. So in our class, in a lecture, there might be 40, 40 of us in a lecture, and it would be people from, from every part of the world, like from Africa, Asia, Europe. North America. It's really cool to have South America to have that collaboration and having everybody together uh, and, and, and studying together. And so we lived right here on the the Via del Genicolo, and then you uh, you wouldn't quite walk that way, but you you come down the hill right down here to this river, and then you walk all the way along this main road. It was kind of busy and loud and annoying, and then you would walk. Well, no, you wouldn't. Where's Piazza Venezia? Oh, no, right here, yep. And you walk this way, and then you come through here and all the way to the pontifical, uh, what is it? Yeah, the, we call it the Angelicum in English, but uh, in Italian, it was the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. In the language? Huh? In the language? In the language. <laughs> so there were three universities a bishop could send his American seminaries and the bishop decided we didn't we didn't decide you could go to the gregorian which was what run by the jesuits so the gregorian the jesuit order known from the 16th century to be the strong anti or um, anti that's not the right word counter reformation intellectual strong um support of the pope that is the jesuits that's the gregorian those classes were only in italian the whole program only in Italian. You could go to Santa Croce, which is Holy Cross. That's run by Opus Dei, a relatively new order within the church and a relatively new university in the church, probably only 30, 40 years old. So that was all in Italian. Or you could go to the Angelica, which is where my bishop sent me, where the classes were in English. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I had a bit of a, I'm kind of a, a competitive person and I don't like to be, uh, I, I like to do well. Right. So I put myself right into it as like, I want to learn Italian, like whatever I do, I really know that, that that's a gift to, to study and live in another country for four years and not learn the language would be to me just that was just not my personality. It was not who I was. I'm always going around trying to meet people, make friends and everything. So I took my, all I had for official Italian coursework was four weeks of Italian work. So I had four weeks and it was all day. And I had a, but after that, I had an Italian tutor. And so she, she was helping me um, like twice a week with homework assignments and stuff like that. But in that four weeks, I learned a lot. I mean, I went from knowing absolutely no Italian, having just studied Spanish, to being able to like 
read a sign, have some conversations, order a coffee, you know, basic things, but certainly not enough to study theology <laughs> or pass an exam. Even, uh, even a cappuccino? Yeah, cappuccino, right? And, uh, but even the guys going to the Italian universities, Gregorian, Santa Croce, that whole system, you have a powerhouse of 40, 30 or 40 Americans in a class. They came up with a note system that had recorded every word a professor had said for the last 10 years. They had it recorded and translated. So you could literally, while the professor was speaking, you had the, you had the Italian on one side and you could read the English <laughs> and the professor pr pretty much stuck right to his notes, right? So he's teaching. And even though it's in Italian, you're reading the English transcript. <laughs> and there are people in charge of improving the transcript every year. So as they're listening, they were always improving the transcript. And then you could use that to study, study for the exams. Now, that was in my experience. We had the, we had the English, English side of things. And I, we had great professors. Really, so the Angelicum University is Dominican. So the Dominicans are the priests and the nuns that wear all white, all white. And they sometimes wear like a black cape. And they follow St. Dominic, right? They're, they're the order of St. Dominic. And Thomas Aquinas is one of the great theologians in the Middle Ages. And this was the university he founded, uh, or his teachings founded, his disciples founded. And uh, so, yeah, the, the classes were great. Now, because I was such a love for trying to learn Italian, I, on my walk to Rome every day, on my walk to class every day, I put headphones in and listen to things in Italian, uh, trying to go out of my way to learn Italian. So, but I, I would, um, uh, what was the point of that? Oh, I, there was two tracks at the Angelicum. There was English and Italian. So you could you could jump from class to class. So I figured out which professors I liked or which professors I thought really knew the subject matter. And, and even if the class was in Italian, I'd start to take the class in Italian. And then I would take my, but I didn't have a note system. I had to take my own notes. So my notes were like half in Italian, half in English, and just like kind of putting it, you know, whatever, whatever I could write fast. Most of the time is writing in Italian was faster just to keep just to because you're hearing Italian, you write in Italian, you thought of it in Italian, and then the exam is in Italian. So when the all the exams were oral exams, so you, there was no homework. I mean, there was homework, but there was no graded homework. There was no grade, but one 10 minute oral exam for every class. You go in front of the professor, you had the he would just ask you any question about the entire semester's subject matter and then he would drill he or she would drill deeper until you couldn't think of an answer then he jumped to another topic do, 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 go do, do. and however you performed he would he or she would usually say dh like a 10 9 8 and that 10 was highest 9 8 7 6 and that was your grade some didn't grade you right then they would kind of wait till later and grade you later but that was it one 10 minute oral exam was your whole semester's work and then you you had a capstone project where you had to write a whole big paper and do a presentation and that was to end your your studies so it was the stb the bachelor program that's three years which is required for ordination then i studied a fourth year at another university called sant'anselmo do you see sant'anselmo no sant'anselmo is like over here is even further. I rode the bus a lot more. I walked this, but Sandan Samo was too far. Rode the bus. And um, uh, that was studying sacramental theology. And that was like a specialization program, like a, something between a master's and a doctorate is what I, but I never finished it. I never went back and finished it after I was ordained. So, huh. oh, well. Uh, so, uh, so the Tiber River. So this is my walk. Uh, I feel like this is like, I'm just talking to you like through my normal day. I hope this isn't boring, but uh, it is like my normal walk. We cross this bridge and this river, of course, is the Tiber River, right? Famous, famous river, the river that runs through the heart, right through the heart of the city. In the ancient Rome, only the whole city, they used the river for defensive purposes too. So the rest of the city was walled off. The river was the other wall and just a small part of the city was walled on the other side of the river called Trastevere, which Tras means over. Tevere is the name of the river, so Trastevere, uh, which is a great place to get great pasta nowadays too. So Trastevere is in, in this section over here. But isn't that beautiful with the trees and the... It's not beautiful in the fall. And I'm gonna tell you why. 
there's these birds, starlings, and they are, have you ever seen that they make these formations, right? And they just, yeah. they like, so they eat olives in November because that's when the <laughs> olive harvest is going and they make unbelievable mess. I mean, it just covers the entire, there, there'd be these little cars parked along. And you couldn't even see the car, just covered <laughs> in bird poo. And just like, and, and you would avoid the river like at all costs because they lived, they would nest in the night or sleep on those trees. There's no other trees in the rest of the area. It's all urban. So those are like the only trees along the river. And so you'd avoid it. And I remember one guy, one time walking to class, this guy next to me walking and a bird flew over a seagull or something. And he got bird, bird doo-doo right here. And he was like, well, I'm not going to class today. And he just walked right home. <laughs> it's like, I'm skipping school today because I'm done. <laughs> Yeah. So the, the 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 city of Rome has its ups and its downs, right? <laughs> Just like anything. Um, so one of the other one of my other favorite places, as you're walking along, the Corso is called the Corso is kind of a. It was actually not a ancient road because all the other roads in ancient times were these little little side roads, but it's is it put in the 19th century just to kind of have a thoroughfare through the city to kind of keep traffic moving. Traffic. Keep traffic moving. Can you imagine traffic in the city of Rome? So in ancient times, the population of Rome was over a million people. And no other city reached the population of a million people until London in the 1800s. No other city had the, the technology, the sanitation, fresh water, sewage, everything that the Romans had back 2,500, well, 20, let's say 20, uh, reached that height of that population um, you know, uh, 1800 years ago, right? In the 200s AD, it reached that population of over a million. Can you imagine? And, and, and the horses and all the other amount of yuck that would be, that would be, that's why they had the aqueducts and the fresh water flowing because it just kept the water. And the Tiber was the sewer. It was the main place that all the yuck would go and hopefully wash away, including all the dead bodies or anything else, you know? Anyway, so it's a glorious, glorious image. But it, as I was walking along, this is one of my favorite churches. I'd stop in here to pray on Saturday mornings. I'd come here for mass quite a bit on Saturday mornings. We could go to mass anywhere in the city. So I'd, I'd love to go up here for mass. It is called Chiesa Nuova. Uh, and it's where St. Philip Neri, uh, St. Philip Neri is buried. So he's right, his body, his, his, uh, his uh, earthly remains are right here under the altar. And I went back to Rome in 2018 after I was ordained a priest and I, I got to celebrate mass uh, right here at the altar of St. Philip, which was a beautiful experience, be a place that I had prayed for so many years and just to go back as a priest to celebrate mass there. Um, so that's the outside of that. Yes, this is the outside of this church. And this, believe it or not, is just the side altar. Wow. That's the, the main altar is huge. Thing. This is just like tucked in the corner sort of uh sort of uh in the corner this is just a a side altar this is a picture of saint philip uh a painting you know uh and saint philip was called the apostle of rome he he founded um orphanages and soup kitchens and formed a band of a band of brothers a band of men that worked together to be like to live a life of holiness the rest of the priests in the 1600s in Rome, you know, sometimes weren't living the most, um, you know, uh, you know, Christ-like lives. And so St. Philip was trying to call that to, uh, a reform. So he was reforming the clergy within Rome by calling, gathering them together and, and having them live common lives. Uh, anyways, this church is called Chiesa Nuova, which means in Italian, new church. It was built in the 1600s. <laughs> and it's still... The new church, I think it has an official name, but nobody calls it that. Everybody knows it as, you know, the new church. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That'd be like here in Alpena, just always calling St. John's the new church, even though it's, yeah. <clears throat> so Chiesa Nuova is always nice to stop by there and visit. And the best thing about visiting Chiesa Nuova is right around the corner is my favorite ice cream shop. <laughs> uh, so what's, you guys know what the Italian word for ice cream is, right? Gelato, right? Everyone knows. So 
um, this this uh, place was the famous. I don't know why it just became the famous place with American seminarians. And I mean, there's 300 of us at the college. So, I mean, you could not go a night without walking by here and there being a line of American seminarians getting ice cream. <laughs> I mean, 300 people. Um, so they loved having the corner on the American market because that meant like we would bring all of our guests, all of our friends. We'd always go to the refrigerator. I don't know how it happened. They must have. Uh, but anyways, they have the corner on the American uh, gelato market because now you'll go there too when you visit Rome, right? So it's right around the corner from Kids and Wolf. Got Kids and Wolf. You just take a side shoot around the corner and you just say, um, you know, where is the frigidarium? Dove frigidarium? And you'd find it. Is it ironic that they use an American frigidaire? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, so it's all handmade, art, artigianale. Artigianale just means like um, artisanal, like it's made handmade uh, ice creams. Gelatos are usually not a lot of cream based, but a lot of, um, the best thing I learned about, this is what Italians do, they never get one flavor of ice cream, never. When you go get gelato, you get two to three flavors always, and you pair them. And then you are always tasting all the different flavors. Isn't that a great idea? Yeah. Why do we do that? We should do that more often. Uh, so I, that's the, one of the best lessons I learned from my Italian brothers and sisters is <laughs> pair the ice creams. Don't get one flavor, get three. <laughs> uh, so it was good. Best place for gelato. It's like our kitchen. Yeah. Uh, so on the journey, you'd pass by the Frigidarium. This would be one of the main squares in the center of the city of Rome, Piazza Venezia. Piazza, you know, is just the Italian word for square. Venezia is actually means Venice. It's so, for, so the center of Rome is named after Venice, kind of ironic. But you know why? So this Piazza Venezia, is a, it's a modern sort of thing. It obviously is not what the Romans would have called it. They didn't care about Venice. The Roman, Rome was the center, right? But by the, by the 16, 17, 1800s, Rome was not the center of, of Italy. Italy was not a unified country, it had multiple languages, multiple um, kings, multiple princes, all fractured into all these people. The unification of Italy didn't happen until the 18, really into the 1860s under, uh, under Garibaldi was the one that kind of led the charge. And the last place, the last holdout to the unification of Italy, you can guess was where? Rome, <laughs> the last city to hold out to the unification of Italy, to a unified government was Rome. Can you guess why? Who would be opposed to a unified Italy? Pope. The Pope, <laughs> right? He was really opposed, it was Pope, Pope Pius IX, um, because until then, the Pope was the head of, not only the head of the Roman Catholic Church and the Catholic Church, but also head of a, Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Holy Roman Emperor, but head of a, a whole series of papal states, right? The papal, the papal states and his power, uh, well, really the taxes, <laughs> uh, that's why you own land, right? Or, be, you know, take care of land is the taxes that come in. And so he, uh, so this bit, this thing is called the monument to the patria, patria, uh, which means the, the fatherland. Uh, this Looks like something from really a long time ago, doesn't it? Looks classical, looks ancient. It was built in the late 19th century. So it has nothing to do with ancient Rome. Uh, in fact, they destroyed some ancient Roman stuff to make room for it. Because <laughs> right behind this is this, the ancient city center, the Roman Forum, right behind it. And they blocked the view of the Colosseum. Well, you can see the Colosseum right here. Just the top of the Colosseum is right right here, uh, and they blocked kind of all that to build this monument to unify Italy. So it, the, the, the Italians, that the Romans, not the Italians, Italians think, oh, this is cool, it's good that we're unified. Romans don't like this place. They don't like, they call this the wedding cake. <laughs> that's, what they, that's what it looks like to them. And the Romans, they're like, eh, it was, it was something that they didn't really, didn't appreciate very much. And then the building off to this side, is where um, in the 1930s and 40s, Mussolini would gather all of his followers and everything and give these big speeches. So they used this piazza in kind of a political center, even though none of the 
political power. None of the bu government buildings reside here. It just became like a, a symbol of unified Italy. Did you guys know that Italy wasn't that unified? So because Italy wasn't unified, it had all these dialects and all these languages. Italians, uh, until the until the really the advent of the radio, did not have a unified language at all. Their unified language, which is standard Italian today, is invented. Invented, like scholars invented it. They took they took the the dialect of Florence, said this sounds like pure Italian because it comes from Dante, and they're like, we'll just modify it, simplify it, and try to get rid of all of the all of the things that make you sound like you're from other parts of the country. So you don't sound like a hillbilly and you don't sound like uh, you're from the Northern or from the Southern. So they tried to, they tried to stamp out all of the, all of the dialects to have a unified, unified language. So that's why Italians or Father Tyler after living in Italy talk with their hands, <laughs> right? Because you could go 20 miles down the road and not speak the same language. Now the languages obviously all come from Latin, they're related but there would be words you wouldn't know. So that's why Italians would, they have these words, they have these symbols, like, um, like instead of saying, you know, you say like, come here. So Italians say, vieni qua. So they go like this, say, vieni, vieni, like that. And then Italians like, say something is good. You taste something, you're like, e buono, like to say like, it's good. You go like this. <laughs> and so, they, so they'd be like, e buono? And you'd be like, si, e buono. And you would go like, you would go like this, even though, because it's like you would using your hands to express what maybe wasn't able to be expressed linguistically because there wasn't enough shared lexicon. There wasn't enough shared words and everything. So uh, was that the advent of sign language? It <laughs> is a kind of sign language for sure. Absolutely. And they have a whole series of other, other, other ones like, um, like uh, uh, this means like let's go, so it'd be andiamo. So it'd be like andiamo, ragazzi, andiamo. So like this means like let's you know we gotta get we gotta get going. Um, there's also a lot of bad words too. Uh, <laughs> uh, ten, I don't know any of them. No. So my so that whole first year, uh, we'll take a pause on my walk to through the. I want to talk a little bit more about the language. So my whole first year, I. I was struggling to learn Italian. I was I was making some Italian friends. In fact, um, I ran in. I was at this prayer service at St. John Lateran, which is the, the cathedral of Rome. Sitting next to me was this young guy. His name was is Giorgio. He spoke a little bit of English. I spoke a little bit of Italian. We we're talking. He invited me. He's like, "Hey, we're we have a young adults group. We we always meet on Saturdays for you know youth group, kind of like a Catholic youth group." And uh, so I went went with them and I got myself completely turned around. Luckily, the priest there uh, knew where the North American College was and he drove me back because we got in the metro and I was like, where am I? I was like, I don't know where I am in the city. And I, we didn't have, I didn't have a smartphone or Google Maps or any of those things back then, all the way back to 2011. Can you imagine? And uh, so anyways, that, like that, yeah, that Giorgio, um, he was a medical student at the time, but we became really good friends. We've stayed in touch. And he was just actually just ordained a priest this last year uh, for the Diocese of Rome. And so he's a priest in Rome for the Diocese of Rome and the Pope ordained him, but I didn't get to go because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I, I watched online, but I really, I'm looking forward to being able to go back and connect with, with Georgia, who's a priest now and, and, and everything. So, so that's one friend I made. Also within a couple of weeks of me arriving, my best friend from Columbus, Ohio, uh, from when I was in seminary, he's now a priest in Columbus. His aunt teaches English, English as like a second language in Rome at the university, at one of the Roman universities. And so we were emailing back and forth and I told her how frustrated I was like not, like I, I thought I could just like instantly learn Italian. Like I, why was it so hard to learn a language? And she's like, you should be a tutor. You should tutor English to some of my students and they could tutor you Italian. And she's like, it'll be free. You know, you just, you don't have to pay anybody. And I was like, yeah, free is good. And um, so I emailed these two young guys and uh, I went out to their apartment. And I mean, their apartment was like way out in the suburbs. I had to transfer buses three times. It took two hours, you know, of all the buses and going everywhere. And I'm like, where am I going? And I get there and I ring the doorbell. Never met these people before in my life, right? We just emailed. 
and uh and they're like come on in go on in well he said Vinny, Vinny. and uh so we come in and we they did not know english <laughs> like, that was, they, you know like i was like you're in college english like this is it's not good i really didn't know italian so like they could have said the same thing but we got to know each other we we would go i'd go out there once in a while we'd have some tutoring sessions that they're getting ready for a test i'd help them with their tests but anyways, you know how I said I had to stay in Rome for, I had to stay in Europe for two years. I had to pick a place to go that summer. We could go anywhere in Europe. We could go anywhere, but just not home. The idea was you spend more time getting immersed in, in, in the world anywhere. And so I was telling my, my Italian, fan, my, my, this Italian guy about this. And he's like, it is no problem. Come live with me for the summer. Come to my family. I said, well, I need to have a, I need to have some kind of church work. I need to, he's like, well, I'll introduce you to the, my pastor. I'll introduce you to a priest. I'm sure there's work to do with the parish. And sure enough, I went down to San Giovanni Rotondo, which is like way in the, the boot, the heel of the boot of Italy. And I lived there for eight weeks with the family. And they just adopted me like right into the family. And my Italian brother was the same age as me. And I worked at the parish. He introduced me to the bishop. And I ran the, the parish vacation Bible school. I remember that was my second arriving in this village that I've never been to before. This lady comes up to me. I'm in the church. The church fills up with like 200 little kids. They're like <laughs> everyone's yelling. And there were these teenagers were sort of involved. Like they were like the high school kids that were organizing the vacation Bible school. And this adult comes up to me and she's like, you're, you're the seminarian, right? You know, all in Italian. I said, yeah, si, si, si. And um, I didn't have my collar on, but yeah, I said, si, si, si. And she's like, good. I've got some things I got to do. You're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> they never met me before. They didn't know me from Adam. I was like, we would never get away with this in the United States. It's like breaking every rule we have about child, children and everything. So I'm like, what do I do? And like the teenagers came up to me. And they're like, oh, you know, they, they, they just, they, loved you just immediately welcomed you into their into their parish and everything like don't worry don't worry uh tyler we'll just do this we'll do that and they did they ran the whole the whole day uh, and then eventually she came back and i was like did i lose any kids like you know so it was a uh, pretty awesome experience but that's how i learned italian by living those eight weeks with the family and by the by the first two weeks was horrible couldn't I felt like I was it was so homesick and I've been in Europe already two years but it was just so homesick to be like in a family but not be able to communicate the next two weeks is like all of a sudden it just clicked how was the food and the food was amazing and my Italian mom and my Italian Nona like the, the lady from the, she would she would teach me and uh show me everything she she lived on the fourth floor so every dinner she'd come home come down and um, she was then she was in her 90s. She, she since has passed. But um, but she was amazing. And we couldn't talk to each other because we didn't speak the same language. Like she could understand standard Italian. I could speak standard Italian, but she grew up speaking the dialect. So if she spoke to me, I'm like, I didn't catch it. So they'd have to translate. They'd have to take it out of the dialect and into. Into standard Italian. And then when I spoke with my accent, my American accent, just like probably you find too, if someone foreign speaks, you're like, hey, like, what are, you, what are you saying? It was the same. She just had a hard time understanding me. But the younger people could understand through my accent, you know, through my American accent. The same spelling of the, you know. No, different spelling, spelling. different <laughs> phrases. So like an example, in San Giovanni Rotondo, that same thing when I said, um, so they would say, so in a standard Italian, it'd be like, ragazzi, andiamo. So like, hey, guys, let's go. Ragazzi, andiamo. But in the dialect, they'd say, aliu, ya machine. <laughs> aliu, aliu was ragazzi. And ya machine was andiamo, andiamoci. But you can see how if you swallow the vowels and change like andiamo could become Uh, if you swallow the vowels and 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 everything and they had a much slower pace of life it was the south everything was slow the northern people they're like how would you go to the north the northern people are so crazy and frantic but in the south we eat well we pray well 
we <laughs> that everything was slow. It, it was <laughs> yeah. Well, temperature has a lot of effect on language. The temperature, your your daily activities has a how you speak. Absolutely, because it affects the way you think. Language is just a reflection of of your the way you think. So cold as hell. Cold as hell. <laughs> so right across the street from. Uh, the the wedding cake. If you go around the corner a little bit, is my favorite restaurant, the Abruzzi. And you can also visit the church right there. Is the San uh, the Dodici Apostoli, where two of the apostles are also buried, Philip and James the Lesser. <clears throat> Philip and James the Lesser are buried buried there. And anyways, this Abruzzi is a great restaurant. Who you guys like Italian food? <laughs> Everyone likes Italian food, right? So this is my favorite Italian dish, carbonara. You guys ever? Tried carbonara? Yeah? No? So it's a quintessential Roman dish invented during World War II. So it's not like something ancient or anything, but it's when they had an abundance of eggs, maybe after somehow, I don't know why uh, they had an abundance of eggs, but some they, they were trying to do something with all the eggs they had. And this chef sort of cook or grandma or somebody came up with making the sauce out of the egg. So you guys want a little quick lesson on how to make carbonara? Yeah. <laughs> so how to make carbonara. It's um, <clears throat> what you do is you get your pasta water going nice and hot, right? Add some salt and go ahead and put your pasta, your rigatoni. I like rigatoni. You can do spaghetti is the classical, but I like a strong rigatoni because it, it holds the sauce better. Then, and another thing you take eggs. I usually do uh, one egg, one full egg and one, egg yolk per person. So you're like, how many people you're gonna have? Uh, or really two people per, I don't know, something like that, whatever. And I crack a bunch of eggs and then you whisk all those together and just a little bit of water because it kind of like gets it creamier. And then you add pepper and then you add um, the pecorino romano. That's the hardest to get. And I go to Meyer every time I go to Meyer, it's in the cheese section. And I go to every time it's only there once in every three times you go to Meyer, but when it's there, I buy it all. <laughs> so then I got a stockpile of Pecorino Romano. And the other thing I buy at Meyer every time is the uh, pancetta. And that is not always there too. It's super expensive, but I buy it. And uh, it's, it's like a uh, non-salted side pork, which is basically bacon. You can use bacon, but it's salted. It has too much salt. It's not the same flavor. So you need the you, pancetta is the right. And you cut the pancetta, brown that in a pan, add the onion and the garlic, get everything nice and crispy. And then when the pasta is just done cooking, you know the key to al dente pasta, right? You know what the key is? Look at the box and it has time, 11 to 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes. Just put a timer, doesn't matter, don't taste it. You don't have to do anything else, but the timer, it, it's, it's scientifically precise. So if it says 11 to 12 minutes, do it 11 minutes, set your timer and you're done. Make sure you stir your pasta, but never, never go more time or less time. It's precise. You never, you never have to guess. It's right there on the box. Every pasta is different though. Every box of pasta says something different. And it's always just follow that. You take the water out, save some of the pasta water because you're gonna need it. You um, drain the pasta. Then while the pasta is really hot in the hot skillet, you add, but not too hot of a skillet because it will cook the eggs too much. So it's just like the right amount of hotness. You add the, the raw egg, the pasta, and the meat, the pancetta. You just mix all that together and it, the hot pasta cooks the egg to the noodles, but without making it curdle. You know, you know how eggs cook sometimes in a curdle, or, you know, forms like, it doesn't do that, it stays creamy. It cooks in like a creamy, half-cooked form of an egg. And that's it. That's You'll demonstrate that one. We should have a cooking class, right? Yes. That would be fun. We can do a cooking class. And here's one. Yeah. Here's the cater right here. That'd be fun. So finishing my walk, finishing my walk through the city of Rome, we come to the, the Roman Forum, the ancient city center of Rome. All these pillars, all these parts, they just been preserved through time. This would have been built up as this was the marketplace, the Senate. Everything was there in the in the the very city 
center of Rome. Great tours right next to the Colosseum. So this is just literally a stone's throw from my university that I'd go to every day. You'd see the Colosseum. Uh, did you know the Colosseum could be, could be filled with water? The bottom of it, they had the, it was hooked up to the aqueducts so that if it wasn't being used for battle, you know, land battles, they could flood the whole bottom of it and stage naval battles for the audience. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And it, the Colosseum was designed that it could fit 50,000 people and it could, be, it could be emptied in 15 minutes. All the records from that time show that when a game was done, Every, all 50,000 people were out in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Father, have they ever done anything to fortify this? Yes. Okay. So you see, you see these things? It kind of looks different than over here. Uh -huh. This is modern to try to, to shore it up. Oh, I see. Now, you might ask yourself, like, why, why, is it be, why, why is it sort of half torn down? Maybe it was earthquakes or something. No, people did that. <laughs> they wanted the stones. <laughs> Why go to a quarry when you've got this giant building full of stones? The, the Colosseum didn't mean anybody anything to people in the 12th century or the 11th century or the 10th century. They just take the stones. So they just picked up the stones, walked away. So all the damage you see to the Colosseum is not caused by nature was caused by man over time interesting huh oops so this is where i would my end of my journey every day was arriving at the angelic university this is our chapel and this was our and like any roman buildings or italian buildings in the center of every building was always a, a cortile a courtyard so right outside, you between classes, you could eat some pomegranates that were growing, oranges. There was always oranges, not all year, but obviously whenever oranges bloomed, I don't know when, but you would just go out there and pick oranges and eat those in between class. I love the pomegranates. That was the best. Uh, and just eat those during class. So. Is that it? That's it. So that was a walk from college to the university every day, plus a couple side side stories along the way. How big were your classes? Only about 30 or 40 uh, students in each of the cycles in, in our English cycle, but in the university was m multiple disciplines, philosophy, theology, language, um, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and then um, advanced studies like biblical, canon law, um, all the other sacred sciences, we call them. I think that you were ordained in Rome also. No, so I was ordained a deacon, which is on your way to being ordained a priest. I was ordained a deacon at St. Peter's in uh, October of 2014, but I was ordained a priest back in Gaylord. So I brought a whole crew from Taos. There was 50 people, uh, my, my mom, my dad, my mom and my sisters came over once for Christmas, my second Christmas there. So I hadn't seen my mom and my sisters for a year and a half. Dad didn't come. He's not much of a traveler, uh, but dad did come for my ordination. And it was a big, big, big deal. Uh, and my granny came, um, my grandma. So it was awesome. Yeah. Was Latin a major uh, language for you to learn? So it was, it was because... Um, I did classical studies and I, I wanted to learn Latin. And I also took a lot of time continuing to learn Latin while I was there. We had a Latin club in the, in the seminary and we had Latin breakfast on Saturday morning. So after going to, we would, we'd just have conversations in Latin with the foremost Latin expert at the Vatican, Father Dan Gallagher, who uh, was a priest of Gaylord, was from Michigan. So I, I got to work with him on Latin and I've kept it up some because at Taos, um, at Taos High School, I was before the pandemic, when I was the priest in Taos, I was teaching a Latin class um, just on, in the mornings. 
couple two Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, I was teaching Latin to the high school kids. They asked for it. They knew they're like, Father, now I was I was their track coach too, track cross country coach. And like, Father, do you know Latin? I was like, Yeah, I mean, I'm not perfect at it, but I know more than you do. And so uh, <laughs> I, I uh, was teaching that class. It was really fun. Yeah. Was the Gallagher from Detroit? Yes. Yeah, he was a neighbor of ours. Oh. Detroit. Oh, on the west go. side of Detroit. There you go. Yeah. Do you still use your Latin? Yes, not every day. Um, when I'm trying to read things or study things, um, sometimes I pray with some, you know, prayers, prayers of the liturgy of the hours and Latin and stuff. But I get very lazy. I used to be really good about praying the rosary or praying other prayers in Italian to keep my Italian up. But I've been very <laughs> Very, very Italian lazy. Oh, I forgot. The only thing that I do really good in Italian is I still watch. Uh, I've got my Netflix set to Italian. Uh, so I get all the latest Italian movies or Italian TV shows. And then I watch those in Italian. And that keeps me. I watch it, but I have the Italian subtitles on, too, because I find even the, even though I'm fluent, like there's just modes of speaking that if I read it, it's better. It's all in Italian, but yeah. And then I always call my Italian family at the holidays and birthdays, and we talk on the phone and stuff. So my Italian mom, she's always saying, Father, I'll, or she's like, I'll pull you, the phrase is, I'll pull your ear, tirare l'ecchio, if you make a mistake. So if, I, if I'm, and she always corrected me, always corrected my grammar and my spelling, or and even at the dinner table. Oh, here's a, good, a funny story. So I came home from um, mass one day and so my time mom was trying to teach me different words so she picked up a watermelon and she said um what do you uh how, what is the name of this what is it how what do you, what's the name of this and i was like oh, I, I couldn't remember i knew it started with an a and at mass we had just sang uh agnello di dio lamb of god agnus dei in latin lamb of god lamb so i said looked it up i picked at it i was like agnello so I was like, it's a lamb. <laughs> they're like, no, anguria, anguria. It's a watermelon, it's a watermelon. So fun things like that, you know, but um, the other people were very, you know, they didn't correct me very much, but, but mama, she made sure she wanted me to have good grammar. And so even silly things like that, the mis they, they would make the same mistakes, you know, the same grammar mistakes. But I always was told, nope, that's not how we say it. I was like, but Marilio just said it that way. <laughs> Well, he's saying it wrong. <laughs> yeah. So now, is it a special thing to be selected to go to the seminary? And yeah, it's a it's a great honor, and and obviously of the you know several thousand seminarians in, in the United States at a given time, only um, you know two or three hundred go there. It's been really hit hard by COVID though, because I mean, um, it's very it's hard to like send somebody there knowing that. They're not going to be able to get back easily and all the COVID restrictions. So since COVID, there's been a real decline in the number of seminarians in Rome. It's actually kind of put the college in danger, you know, financially and everything. So, Was your university terms basically the same as what we have here? They start much later. So classes didn't start till October, but they went till the end of June. And there was always three weeks at the end of the semester for exams. Wow. Three weeks to take your exams and you scheduled your exam with your professor, you know? So we would rush to get our exams scheduled in one week so that you'd have two weeks off. Because <laughs> in your off time, you could travel all around Europe. So we had one weekend a month, you could travel anywhere. So a lot of times during class, if I wasn't paying attention, I'd be on my computer searching for cheap flights to go to Romania for the weekend or... <laughs> wherever I wanted to go for the weekend, you know, with my, you figured out quickly who you like to travel with too and who you didn't like to travel with. <laughs> and you wouldn't travel with them again. You travel with your, your friends. Uh, so, yeah. Did the church pay for your studying for your education? Yeah. So the, the whole process there in Rome was all paid for by the diocese. Um, now my undergraduate studies, that was 50, 50. So it was like a half, 50% scholarship. So I, I do student loans for the rest of my undergrad work, but graduate studies are all paid. And actually studying in Rome is way more cheaper, way, way cheaper than in the United States because the university costs are extremely somehow subsidized. Um, a year study, year's tuition was 
was um, 2,000 euros for a whole year of university studies. So 2,000 euros is about $2,300. You don't go to a whole year's worth of college university for $2,300. Now the expensive part was the college, like where we lived with our food and our room and board and everything. That was actually the, the, more, the more expensive part, but it's still way less than studying in Rome. And I, and I had a scholarship from a priest that started Boys Town in Nebraska, that whole Boys Town movement. Uh, he had an inheritance and he started a scholarship and an endowment that paid for, um, I think a third of the whole cost um, for, for seminarians like me from rural parts of the country. So not city guys, but guys that came from rural, rural areas. So it's pretty cool. But anyways, I thought that would be a fascinating topic to share with all of you. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to have you back. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Father, Father Tyler, what is the capacity of the facility? Uh, when you were there, or did you use them before? I think I developed them there. I developed a lot of things in Rome. First, <laughs> I would like for everyone to also join me in thanking Tyler. Oh, yeah. And Tyler, your last name is Winnowick. 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 Okay. Winnowick. Okay. Winnowick. 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 Winnow